Well, thank you all for joining us and welcome to our session, Pathways for an Economic Reset. Now, you all have a chance to, of course, ask as many questions as you want. So please uh, send those questions through using the Slido app and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Now, I couldn't be more delighted to do this session because it's a very important topic. And we're trying to figure out, you know, as we know, COVID-19 is really exposing some of the inadequacies of economic systems, causing global concerns for lives, but also our own livelihoods in the longer term. So in this panel, we're going to try and assess what we can do differently. And as leaders, try and chart a transition to a greener and more inclusive recovery. What will policy reforms look like um, to try and improve social mobility as well? I'm delighted to be joined by my all-star panel, Ahem Steiner, Administrator, United Nations Development Program, and Finucane, uh, Vice Chair at Bank of America, Brad Smith, President of Microsoft, and Alan Jope, he's Chief Executive Officer of Unilever. So thank you all for joining us. I wanted to just start with a very broad but difficult question and ask each of you if you think the ESG agenda is more likely than not to emerge strengthened from this recession. Achim, let's start with you. Thank you very much, Francine. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you and, and such a distinguished panel. So I think my answer is um, absolutely yes. And I think it is in part because what this pandemic has done so far is not really changed the future yet, but it has very much revealed the present. And I think if you look at what is happening in our world from a pandemic to an economic freefall, the first thing that has become obvious is how vulnerable we are, how vulnerable poorer people are, how vulnerable our economies and societies are, to a situation in which, you know, basic health coverage, um, inequality in terms of poverty, but also the digital gap, which has suddenly become so uh, critical in, in people's ability to cope with lockdowns, have shown the world to, to be when it is essentially leaving so many behind. And I think that is a critical part of understanding that as we look forward, um, the role that business markets, the economy at large, um, will play in allowing us to return or to build forward better. I mean, there are many phrases that we use right now. Clearly, this is a historic moment. It is a project of extraordinary possibility, but also a very frightening prospect. Because if you simply veer back to the normal of yesterday, we will be weaker, we will be economically damaged, and we will still be operating with the same kind of inequalities, but also the sustainability Achilles heels that have defined the last decades of, of development progress. And as the United Nations, as the head of the United Nations Development Program, we have focused very much on trying to help countries see how they can work together through parliaments, but also with business, with civic leaders, in trying to address the ability to stabilize with an opportunity to also invest in um, more opportunities in the future whether it is addressing the need for particularly looking after the vulnerable and the poor with a temporary basic income right now in order to make the lockdowns and the containment of the virus more feasible, whether it is a massive investment in the transition towards a greener economy, but it is also to understand the significance of connecting all citizens um, that are able to and want to use the internet and broadband in the coming years, because right now only half the world's, just over half the world's population actually has access to broadband which is why also over a billion children cannot go to school right now. So these are just examples of where ESG in the way that businesses, shareholders, but also markets understand their role in the larger drama that is playing out becomes a very central issue. And I think very much the focus also in boardrooms and with many CEOs around the world. And do you agree with that? Will something actually change? A lot of people, you know, understand what's at stake, but given the severity of the recession, given, you know, the the, the scarring that we're living through, will ESG really get a boost? Well, I think we have to transcend the, the notion that ESG somehow operates in a space of its own. I think it is very much linked to what kind of government policies, what kind of priorities do our society set? I think we should not be complacent. History teaches us that Sometimes out of crisis come great moments of pivoting forward into a better, into a more positive reality, but more often than not, the tendency is to try and just scramble back to where we were before. So I think ESG needs to be understood in a larger public debate about what kind of societies do we want, what kind of economies do we wish to have, and out of that, I think, will come also a new direction for ESG. But it certainly will be broader. I think it will be less corporately defined. I think it will be more embedded in a larger view and consensus around what makes our societies healthy, happy, successful, sustainable, 
and that in turn will define also the economies within which businesses operate and where ESG is an instrument, a tool. It's, it's not an end in itself. And Shana, can, how can company-led initiatives you know, drive this new agenda? Well, I agree with um, much of what Akim j has just said, in, but, but I do think we have hope here because in recent years, there's a, a, a fair amount of data that's been um, put forward to demonstrate that ESG, if it's inculcated into the behavior of a company, that the company itself does better, less bankruptcy, higher satisfaction with its clients and customers, and even sometimes a higher multiple. So all of those are accrued to the benefit of, of uh, looking at ESG. You know, uh, a few years ago, I guess a year or so ago, uh, the Business Roundtable put out a statement that they would look at things beyond shareholders. But I think that's been established through the World Economic Forum and its stakeholder capitalism um, mandate for years. And those companies that have taken up that mantle have simply done better, particularly now during the pandemic, because they've thought about their employees and uh, the social contract they have with their employees. They've thought about their customers and the social contract that they have with them. And they are doing better than those that have just ignored it. Further, uh, I think whether it's looking at the European Commission and soon the European Parliament's uh, passage of a Green Deal, new language in the European Commission, uh, new language by the SEC, new language by the International Federation of Accountants, where this sort of um, broadening its mandate beyond pure uh, financials is making a big difference. There is some new work that's going on. Uh, it, it was established, we uh, raised it at the uh, Davos in January. Alan is uh, very much involved in this, so I won't take his thunder, but Unilever is a big leader here. Uh, 200 companies came together uh, working with uh, the IBC, the International Business Council, the WEF, um, uh, Bank of America chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan is uh, the chair of the IBC. And we worked with four, uh, the big four accounting firms, these 200 companies to see if we could come up with metrics that we could agree on. Uh, and those metrics would indicate the sort of ESG kind of platform that all of us would agree to. And I'm encouraged to say that over 120 companies have, have signed on. I think there will be announcement as soon as tomorrow from the WEF about this. So I see this as being from a regulatory point of view, from a legislative point of view, and from uh, I think companies own sense of uh, survival in the future that uh, we're seeing a real convergence now that we had not heretofore seen and measurable. So, so Alan, let me go to you because we're getting a couple of questions that, that basically kind of goes back to the idea that Anne was talking about and is how long will it take for us to realize that all economic activity needs to be part of a circular economy and guided by ecological principles? I mean, is it encouraging business or is it encouraging governments to see it like that? Alan, you might be muted. You need to unmute. Well, yeah. I definitely was muted. Uh, you know, Francine, sometimes cliches are true. Uh, you measure what you treasure, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. Um, and yet our main measures of success remain solely financial. It's bizarre and it's outdated. Uh, you know, the def definition of success for a country, which is usually GDP or company, our traditional financial metrics, are built on you know, environmental degradation and growing inequality. Um, and surely COVID-19 has been brought home how interdependent all our systems are. We need 21st century tools for a 21st century environment. And so we're huge supporters of standardizing, actually and mandating non-financial reporting that uh, Anne referred to. We strongly support the WEF IBC work, look forward to the launch tomorrow. But this uh, reporting of non-financial metrics we think is just one of five changes that a business can make. The other four are not a surprise. It's really believing that operating to the benefit of multiple stakeholders works. Serving customers, properly looking after your employees, 
being fair with suppliers, making a positive contribution to society and the health of the planet will lead to better financial returns. Most business leaders still don't believe that. They see it as a trade-off between financial returns and responsible conduct. Then we need to price in major externalities, carbon being the most obvious example, and we need to shift our R&D investment and our business model development towards a circular versus a linear approach. And the business case is there. So to directly answer the question, um, the business case for circularity is crystal clear. And then the final point is, uh, as businesses, we need to be committed to fair value distribution along the com company's value chain. And that means not just whether you're paying your people properly, are your suppliers paying properly, are your distributors paying their people properly? Um, and once you've made that uh, mental shift, get our, we need to get our investors on board, uh, create belief and reskill our management and advocate for the, these types of changes. When we do that, uh, business will uh, be a positive force good in the world. And um, Brad, if you look at you know what Microsoft has been doing, of course, digital skills, reskilling, upskilling, but are governments doing or not? Do you sometimes feel like if if you look at all this you know technological language for workers, does it feel like it's really businesses that are doing the heavy lifting? Well, I think we're all going to need to do more in the business community and in government circles alike. Um, I do think that one of the lasting changes from this pandemic. Uh, is the uh, increasing acceleration of digital technology. Um, you know, I'm not prepared to sign up for the proposition that we'll all live the rest of our lives on Zoom calls. I think there's a lot to be said for getting together with people in person. But we're finding in so many ways that jobs are becoming more digital. Uh, we're finding that telehealth services, for example, are an enormous complement to the uh, ability to see a, a doctor or a nurse in person. Uh, and uh, almost every job that we see through LinkedIn, which Microsoft owns, uh, is becoming more digital. So what does that mean? It means that people are gonna need more digital skills. Um, I do think there's a lot more that governments need to do to help with this part of the economy, uh, you know, to invest in more digital skills in you know, education and higher education, uh, to provide new resources to people, to pursue lifelong learning. But I also think there's an important connection between the private and public sectors in this regard. If you look back at the last 20 years, um, after an upsurge in employer investments in employee skilling in the late uh, in, you know, 1990s, uh, we've seen 20 years of decline and then stagnation by employers investing in the skilling of their employees. And I think especially as we look to a recovery, we need to have a recovery uh, that is led in part by small business. We're gonna to need to help small businesses onboard new employees. We're gonna to need to help small businesses invest in skilling of their employees. And, and this is a huge opportunity, I think, for governments to think anew about tax credits and uh, other incentives they can provide. But ultimately it's an ecosystem that brings the public and private sectors together. That's the way we, I think we need to think about it. But Brad, do you think we need to change metrics? So, you know, not look at GDP or not look at shareholder return and find another language to bring I, I think the real message, in. I think the message, and I, I think we're, we're all saying it perhaps in slightly different ways, you know, it's not as if, you know, economic metrics are going to go away. It's not as if GDP is no longer important. It obviously is. But I think we've all realized that there's more to life and there's more to success. Uh, than uh, economics and money alone. And I think that this is uh, a realization that's been spreading across the business community across the past five years. You see that in the business roundtables, you know, really broad support uh, for the approach that they've taken in the last year. Uh, I think having a roadmap with metrics, uh, as you're hearing here, I think that's enormously helpful. Uh, and uh, you know, ultimately, I've always felt that it's perhaps less about um, you know, business success versus societal responsibility and perhaps more about long-term versus short-term ways of thinking. Uh, you know, if you wanna buy a stock on Monday and sell it on Wednesday, um, I've never stood up and said, buy Microsoft. Uh, if you wanna buy a stock in 2020 and hold it to 2030, 
I think you should want to invest in companies really like Bank of America and like Unilever and like Microsoft, where we are focused on what we're doing in the communities where we work and in the world as a whole. Because I think that is going to make us more successful. It's going to attract and retain stronger employees. It's going to build the kinds of ties that will bind us with our customers. And so I, I think long-term business and societal success can move forward together. And Finucane, what can, and, and these are some of the great questions that are also coming in, what can society do to incentivize the adoption of stakeholder capitalism? Like what Brad is saying makes sense, but how much can you actually make sure that people really adopt it and go forward with it? Well, I, uh, I think in terms of shareholders and stakeholders, if you're an investor, individual or an institutional investor, the expectations of the companies in which you invest in um, needs to be heard. So I assure you that uh, any company, any one of the public companies you're talking uh, to here today, we are hearing our shareholders, we are hearing our stakeholders. They are broader than just economic. They are, they are looking for us to be citizens of the world. And whether we are uh, abiding by the various sort of alphabet soup of, of uh, third parties that evaluate us for climate or ESG. Part of what we're talking about here today is that we wanna set a benchmark with the IBC work, International Business Council work and the WEF, so that we can have a metrics that are completely transparent to the world from all companies, because that will be a very effective starting point for all of us. It will be an immediate indicator of who is doing uh, this sort of half, you know, maybe two dozen uh, elements of these of these metrics, and who isn't doing them. And then, as a an investor, whether it's an individual and in their four hundred one k or an, an institutional investor, those companies that abide by those rules and are doing well at them should be your first choice. And I think they already are. I mean, all of us meet with institutional investors all the time. And the question of ESG did not come up five years ago, and it came up sort of four years ago. And in the last three years, they are in the room, and that is front and center for every conversation. And Akim, where should these metrics really come from? I mean, are, are you seeing a lot of people really asking the right questions, but then being committed to them? Or is there a danger that once we get out of the pandemic, we go back to what we were like four or five years ago? I think one of the sobering lessons of the, you know, the last financial crisis, 2008, 2009, is that it, in a sense, was largely driven by a quick return to normality. And yet what we witnessed in the, in the years subsequently is that maybe on the stock markets, we were doing very well, but in our societies, we were increasingly seeing the ruptures and, and the consequence of not acting at the time. Um, you know, before this pandemic, and we, we witnessed on our television, you know, sets every night, protests breaking out from Hong Kong to Santiago de Chile to Paris, the United States. I mean, there, there is a great deal of um, uh, conflict um, that is manifesting itself around the kind of choices that have been made. So I think the first thing is we must acknowledge that indeed we are in the midst of a, of a situation that is perhaps without precedent and in an odd sort of way, the long-term has suddenly become the short-term reality. And the short-term decisions that we make have become the lock-ins for the long-term. And I think this is shifting very much what Anne, what Brad and Alan uh, just spoke to as well, how businesses look at, at the future of markets. And here, I think transparency and accountability and being part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem are just sort of three headlines that I think capture well what what consumers, what, what markets, what investors are looking for. And, you know, Alan and I were just before this call together in, in, a, in another call that's on Champions 12.3. It's a sustainable development goal that deals with, um, with food loss and food waste. When you realize that in our world today, we lose up to one third and waste up to one third of all the food produced. Here is an extraordinary irrationality in our economy um, we can address it if you look with Brad and I, I've had very good conversation with Microsoft also the digital gap. This is not something that has to be a reality. We can close that digital gap in the next few years. And, and um, FinTech, um, the whole 
opportunity that arises with the emergence of digital finance technology to bring literally hundreds of millions of people into the financial system that are so far excluded and, and simply because they don't have any collateral, they don't have an address, don't exist. All of these are good examples of how you know, revolutionary transformations are possible, but they need to be embraced by leaders in business. Governments have to incentivize, enable them. And I think then consumers will reward people also um, and, and companies for making those choices. And the ability to, to measure that and to demonstrate that you are indeed changing course, I think is an important part of our much more transparent and um, let's say mature public scrutiny of, of governments, of business, of the United Nations for that matter. So yes, I think that's, that's the direction. But Ahima, how difficult is it for governments to come together and collaborate at a time where you have a lot of geopolitical questions, and this goes back to one of the questions being asked on Slido, uh, but also you know, protectionism. Until we have that, how difficult is it to, to come together as nations? Well, I often remind people that if you ever are involved in uh, a local uh, parents teachers association or in a local community, um, <clears throat> you know, representational form, you know, differences in views are, you, you know, not unique to, to intergovernmental relations. I think we have to recognize that there will always be different views on how to move forward. The fact that we are passing through a period right now that is from a geopolitical point of view, first of all, increasingly polarized. And secondly, with the pandemic, also under enormous stress. And that's why, you know, behind me, you see the empty General Assembly Hall, although this morning it is actually uh, not empty. It is the beginning of, of um, the high-level General Assembly week. Um, I think points to the fact that it is extremely challenging, but I think we have time and again over the last 75 years of the United Nations being in existence found ways in which, despite our differences, we can find common ground. And when you listen to what my fellow panelists have just addressed, then this is a moment where all differences notwithstanding, there is no way forward out of the pandemic or indeed in terms of some of the inequality, sustainability issues without international cooperation. So wisdom and also, um, let's say, good judgment is required while there is a lot of anger in, in our um, um, political atmosphere. But that's precisely why I believe those of us who can counter that notion that we are falling apart as a global community need to speak up now, but not only speak up, we need to act. And that's what gives people hope. And that is where polarization becomes less powerful and you know, rational thinking and um, the sense that solidarity and cooperation are as much in my self-interest as they are in the interest of solving these issues becomes the driving force. This is not just lofty ideals. It's actually what history has taught us time and again. I'm getting quite a lot of questions um, about uh, greenwashing. Alan, let me start off with you. So this question is basically, how can we ensure a framework against the troubling evolution of corporate greenwashing? So Alan, maybe lay out you know, the, the top three priorities that you would do, either a common language or new metrics to try and avoid this. Yeah. Um, well, I think it kind of comes back to uh, two things. One is um, a belief system and the other is uh, reporting non-financial metrics. So a lot of the, even the discussion here, even the questions that are coming in are predicated on an assumption that there is a trade-off between either delivering on ESG metrics or delivering strong financial performance and that investors and retail investors and people will somehow or other choose, do I invest in an ESG responsible company or in a company that drives better financial performance? And we have to break that paradigm. We have to uh, build the evidence that offering sustainable solutions to consumers, conducting yourself with decency makes you an attractive uh, employer, that treating suppliers uh, well, that reducing your environmental footprint actually lowers costs, and all these things drive better financial performance, then there will be less suspicion, there will be a belief that is not a trade-off between ESG and better financial performance, um, but so long as we present it as one or the other, um, the, the shift will never happen. And then in terms of corporate greenwashing, actually what Anne was talking about there, we've got the big four accounting firms designing and developing these standardized metrics. And I think they will become 
um, as reliable uh, for all their strengths and weaknesses as, as traditional financial metrics. Um, and uh, frankly, I can tell you, leading a big company that takes a lot of initiative on environmental and social issues, um, there's nowhere to hide. So we publish everything, and uh, if it's not accurate, we get called out on it. So um, I believe society will hold us to account. Um, but if we make it easier for society to do that by having standardized metrics, uh, we'll be in a better place. And what would be your, your two or three priorities? Uh, well, it's easy. Climate and nature is the first. Social impact is the second. Um, and, and probably waste and your waste footprint would be the third. Okay. And Finnegan, your priorities? Uh, well, I think my first priority is to see this work uh, be presented and embraced. In addition to the four accounting firms setting the metrics, they're working in conjunction with the Global Reporting Initiative, SASB, which is Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and um, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. So they aren't doing it on their own. They've got uh, some of the best uh, standard setters in the world uh, at their side setting, setting these metrics. That's one. Uh, the other is that so many companies uh, are already carbon neutral. And to be carbon neutral, that means you have to have uh, the greenhouse gas protocol evaluate your work in three scopes, one, two, and three. One and two are what make you carbon neutral. Three is what will get us all to net zero. Again, that's a third party evaluating us. Uh, and we, for instance, are uh, carbon neutral. And then I guess, uh, again, to eliminate the idea of greenwashing, you've got the European um, Parliament who will soon pass a green deal. Once the green deal is passed, it isn't just that we'll be at net zero in 2050, it's that we will be more than halfway there by 2030. And every company that's a multinational will have to figure out how to make that uh, transition. 2030 is like yesterday for us. So uh, the ability to make that transition, you aren't going to do it in one part of the world and not another. You will go across your entire company and make sure it can get to net zero. So that's an immediate uh, incentive to get going. And although the U.S. has uh, doesn't have similar legislation, and as everyone knows, it's more political in the U.S., as a practical matter, any multinational will move to uh, abide by the Green Deal because, because they're operating in Europe. And also, maybe if you want to take this next question, which is what changes and adjustments are needed in the financial sector to reflect a more integrative and long-term thinking of business? And this person is also asking, what about the role of taxation? Well, I think there's, uh, it depends on what government you're in to determine whether it's uh, taxation or incentive, but probably will be both, by the way. Uh, well, I would say if you put as a very practical matter, once the Green Deal passes, uh, any company, every company that's a multinational and any company in Europe will need financing to get there. So the financial institutions know that already, uh, whether it's issuing a green bond, underwriting a green bond, uh, uh, capital markets is getting involved. I think the biggest problem that all of us will have is once you get to how you get to carbon neutrality, there's always gonna be an offset. There's something in your operation that can't uh, be done renewably with solar or wind. You can't buy all entirely renewable electricity for one reason or another. And we all require offsets. Right now, most of the offsets are in the nonprofit world like reforestation in the Amazon um, or wind farms that, that are nonprofits. There will be a market, there'll be carbon pricing, I think there will be a market for the offsets and that's actually an economic opportunity for those that are in the renewable business. Brad, what would you have as top two or three priorities to, you know, to accelerate this change? Well, the first thing I would point to is, is climate and I, I think in particular carbon. Uh, you know, that's why we committed that we'll be carbon negative as a company by 2030. Um, I do think just to pick up on some of the themes we're all talking about, um, you know, we need to have transparency and we need to have transparency based on a common vocabulary and common measurement systems. Uh, I think that's the best way to preclude the risk of greenwashing. 
Uh, I think we should aspire to live in a world where say by 2030, if not sooner, um, as consumers, we can look at the products that we buy, whether it's an automobile or something smaller, uh, and uh, understand how much carbon was emitted to create that automobile, just like we understand today how many calories we'll consume when we buy a product at the grocery store. And even though this is a time, as you pointed out, where I think it's harder to bring governments together, the truth is that's probably the last step in the process anyway. Before you need, before you can get to say government regulation around something like transparent reporting of carbon emissions, you need standards. And that's what we're talking about here. Before you get to standards, you need experimentation. And I think this is where businesses together with NGOs can move more quickly and lay the foundation. Um, the two other issues that I would point to more briefly are closing the digital gap, I think for any company in the tech sector. Um, it's what we know best, it's what we contribute to most, it's where we need to put a large part of our energy. Uh, and finally, I would say, especially as a company headquartered in the United States, um, if we're not prioritizing racial equity in 2020, then there probably will never be a year when we do. Uh, I think it's an imperative across uh, the United States. It's an issue that reaches around the world um, it absolutely is and needs to be a priority for a company like ours. Yeah, for a company, Brad, but also for governments. Are governments doing you know, enough to address inequalities that are, have just been exacerbated by the pandemic? Well, look, I think the short answer is for anything that we're talking about here and for anyone we're talking about, the answer is the same. No, we're not doing enough. <laughs> we're not doing enough because these problems are huge. And we're living through a period of time where in many ways, we're either learning more as we are about something like to say internet connect connectivity or things are becoming worse because of a recession. So we need to do more. And I think fundamentally we need to do more individually and we need to do more together. I think it's a good time to think a little bit about the roles we each play. Businesses play one role in the economy and you know, we, we need to have business models that are profitable, but they also can be business models that are responsible. Civil society, NGOs, you know, are the foundation of so many countries uh, around the world and they need to be innovating and we need to be doing more to support them. And ultimately, absolutely, we need governments to, doing, to, to do more, both individually and, and collectively, regionally and globally. That's the only hope for you know, more progress on something like the sustainable development goals. Achim, I'm getting quite a lot of questions actually on you know, large corporates versus small corporates. So many of these recommendations this person writes in are focused on global large corporate world companies, but how can this also be applied to small and medium sized businesses? Absolutely correct. And I think a vital question because we often forget that in, in most countries around the world, when we talk about business, Business is actually small, medium scale enterprises and very often even micro uh, enterprises. Um, it's also the famous informal sector and in many developing countries in which UNDP works, people earn their livelihood 70, 80% of the time in the informal sector. They have no social protection. They run a corner shop, maybe a workshop, a garage, a service provider. That's one end. And I think it is critical that we first of all enable them to have a more equitable opportunity. I mean, whether it is access to, to broadband, for example, to turn their business um, you know, into something that can keep up with the rest of the markets. And there's a very simple example in Uganda, in the middle of the lockdown, one of the projects that UNDP undertook is to help market traders in the vegetable markets to essentially create a sort of Uber equivalent platform to be able to connect to consumers in Kampala in order to be able to give them some opportunity to trade with agricultural produce. Extraordinary things are happening in this digital space right now. And I think our ability to understand that, um, you know, even in a country like Japan, 98% of businesses there are small, medium scale enterprises. So this is not a phenomenon only in developing countries. <clears throat> means that we, on the one hand, look to the larger corporations who shape markets and, and also consumer perception to be leaders in um, moving these agendas forward. But we have to then put special programs in place. And that's where Again, digital finance becomes so critical. Another example in the pandemic is, um, you know, there are now digital platforms where small, medium scale enterprises can borrow money 
literally either in the morning in order to buy produce, sell it in the market and, and, and repay it on their, on their smartphone, or indeed enterprises can borrow, as in China with um, the Ant Group, where with algorithms, artificial intelligence, um, their application is processed in a few seconds and they're able to borrow money. We have entirely new frontiers in the financial system here that also are an opportunity to precisely cater to the needs of a small, medium-scale enterprises. So um, to your um, question or the question I would ask, I can only um, reaffirm that we have indeed to better understand how we also help those businesses to be part of a transforming marketplace where technology, um, consumer preferences, and the imperatives to act on something like climate change um, are much more central, but also um, actionable for them. Alan, do you see a way, I mean, being a big company, do you see a way of maybe bridging this sustainability or ESG gap between small and big companies? I think that uh, big companies have got the responsibility to pioneer uh, the techniques and methodologies um, that we were talking about um, and make them available to uh, smaller companies to adopt. Remember, um, small companies are often the suppliers or customers of big companies. We're interdependent here. Um, and one particular area uh, of importance is that as devastating as the health impact of COVID has been, I think the ripple effects on well-being, well, sorry, on livelihoods um, as the, uh, the true size, the true scale of unemployment ripples through various economies is going to be devastating. And actually now is just the moment when governments might have the political breathing space um, to unlock uh, job creation in new sectors. And that nearly always begins with um, SN, small and medium sized enterprises. So I think this is a this idea that um, small businesses can be part of uh, building back um, a more just uh, economy is something that governments can hop on right now. Um, Brad, talk to me maybe about some of the key challenges actually ahead. I mean, you know, even if there's a converging view, what do you see as the top three um, things? And this is actually a question that's also coming in. What are the key challenges in preparing the company strategy or the world strategy to design a successful pathway to the Great Reset? Well, I think there's two things that are interesting to think about. I mean, first of all, companies do different things. They have different missions. And uh, as we think about, you know, for example, of all the world's challenges reflected in the SDGs, um, I, I think the first question is for each of us who are in a business, where do we best fit in? What can we contribute? Um, you know, it, it, it would be odd if Unilever and Microsoft were trying to do exactly the same thing. We're in different industries. Uh, the same is true for Bank of America. But by each focusing on what we do well, we can actually complement and partner with each other. And I think that is the, the, the first sort of pragmatic question for business. I think a second one builds on what we've just been talking about and what Alan was referring to. I think we always have to keep in mind, you know, businesses do need to operate with at least a level of profitability, meaning you know, not losing money at a minimum. And not everybody can do the same thing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily realistic to expect a small business to do uh, the same thing as a large business in a particular moment of time. Uh, and the same can be true of business, large businesses in different economic sectors. I'll give you a concrete example. Um, at Microsoft, we are in month seven of paying all of the hourly workers who work in our offices around the world, regardless of whether there is any work for them to do. A lot of them have had no work to do for seven months because so many of our offices have been closed. Um, most of these individuals are actually paid not by us directly, but by other suppliers, small businesses. So we pay the small businesses and we ensure that the small businesses continue to compensate these individuals. We should do that in my view, in part because we can afford to do that. Digital technology has been an, a beneficiary of this pandemic if you just look at company revenue streams. Is it feasible for a large airline to do that or a large hotel? No, uh, you know, they're, they're in different economic straits. 
So if we start by asking ourselves where we can make the best contribution and then ask ourselves what we can afford to do and each do what we can, uh, I think you start to put together a recipe that can bring businesses together. And Finnegan, where, where do you see the biggest challenge or challenges? Well, specific to small businesses, I think that, uh, as Alan said, the, the, the onus is on the larger companies first. But we, uh, of course, we're the, in the United States, the largest lender to small businesses. So we have a pretty good insight into what their issues are. And uh, the first is generally, you need to create a bigger marketplace for the small businesses to, to do more business. So with big companies, we're working on that now. We made a billion dollar commitment for uh, racial uh, sort of uh, equality in terms of wealth creation and economic opportunity in the US. And really we're starting with small businesses and trying to create uh, job creation for individuals to either work for us or other large companies or even small businesses, giving them some training. For a small business itself, uh, I think that to the degree that we have contracts with them and we set certain expectations and we pay them well enough, that in turn allows them to pay their own people. So this is a very circular um, opportunity and I think we all see it as being quite real with minimum wages being uh, lifted Technology has allowed us all to uh, do more in less time. So uh, those people that work for us have a big, bigger opportunity for health benefits and better minimum wage. Uh, Alan, what do you see? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, look, um, I noticed one of the questions that's come in on the uh, Slido is, how can we get China, Russia, and the US to cooperate closely together to ensure we remain on the same page? Now, I think, that particular question might be just outside the remit of this panel. Um, however, <laughs> however, I doubt there's a global business person who would disagree with the fact that global free trade has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It is global trade that has allowed the development of a middle class across the emerging world. It is precisely because we have a globally connected interdependent supply chain that Unilever has been able to continue to supply our products through this crisis. If we would have retreated to some bizarre form of national integrity, making only locally for locally around the 150 or so countries in the world that we do business, we would be out of business. And so I just ask all business leaders and, and everyone on this panel who are listening in, to please don't give up advocating for global free trade because it will play such an important role in the post COVID economic recovery in the world. Yeah, and on that, I'd like to hand it to Sadia Tahidi, head of the New Economy and Society platform to share the next steps on how the ideas generated in this discussion and other discussions will be taken forward through the forum's platform to enable the uh, co-creation of frameworks for proactively shaping an economic recovery and economic resilience and also reset. So Sadia, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me thank you, Francine, for your excellent moderation as always. Um, thank you to Alan, Brad, Anne, and Akim. All of you are uh, collaborators and, and, and friends and uh, people who we have been driving forward a lot of um, impact with. So thank you very much for joining this very rich and nuanced conversation. I think we heard quite a bit of uh, nuanced realism about the challenges ahead, but we also heard quite a bit of optimism about this being the moment to deploy uh, our capabilities um, uh, to, to try to achieve that economic uh, reset. Um, at the forum, uh, we'll be doing uh, quite a bit of work, uh, first uh, focused on this pillar on economic growth, transformation, recovery, and revival. Second, focused very much on uh, jobs, wages, social safety nets, um, and the future of work. Third, focused on education, skills, and lifelong learning. And fourth, focused on equity, inclusion, and social justice. And I think you heard all of those themes here today 
particularly, I'd like to call out a new effort where we're trying to look at a new dashboard for the new economy. So similar to what the ESG space is doing in terms of the corporate metrics, what needs to be done at a more national level, and then working with a number of countries to actually see if we can use this moment of transformation to adopt those new policy targets and to adopt ways of being able to measure fairer and greener economies. More on that uh, later on today, uh, from the 20th to the 23rd of October at the forum's Jobs Reset Summit, we will be continuing large part of today's conversation. With that, again, thank you, Francine, and thanks to the rest of the panelists. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.